a call for Singapore's majority Chinese community to be more sensitive to the needs of minorities. Speaking at a forum today, Finance Minister Lawrence Wong says racism exists in the country and that racist acts are unacceptable. He says policies will be updated where necessary to strengthen Singapore's unique brand of multiracialism. Deborah Wong with this report. Racism still exists in Singapore. It's among us, in our streets, our neighbourhoods and our workplaces. There is a, there is a race and, and... An acknowledgement amid not... verbal attacks and even physical ones. Sometimes no words or blows are needed at all. Mr Wong's message is clear. No matter the strides Singapore has made on multiracialism, it's still far from perfect. We must recognise that in any multiracial society, it is harder to be a minority than a majority. This is so everywhere in the world. So it is important for the majority community in Singapore to do its part and be sensitive to and conscious of the needs of minorities. This cuts across all aspects of daily life. It matters to someone who faces discrimination when looking for a job. It matters when someone feels left out when everyone else in a group speaks in a language that not all can understand. It matters to potential tenants who learn that landlords do not prefer their race. It matters to our students, neighbours, co-workers and friends who have to deal with stereotypes about their race or insensitive comments. These things do happen, not always and perhaps not even often, but sometimes they do. And when they do happen, they cause real hurt, which is not erased by lightly dismissing them as casual remarks or jokes. Turning to the topic of Chinese privilege, Mr Wong also says the community isn't monolithic. Even among them, there are those who also feel disadvantaged. We still have a whole generation of Chinese Singaporeans who are more comfortable in Chinese than English and who consider themselves at a disadvantage in an English-speaking world. They feel they have already given up much to bring about a multiracial society. Chinese language schools, Nanyang University, dialects and so on. What do you mean by Chinese privilege, they were asked, for they do not feel privileged at all. Naturally, many of them would object to being so characterised. Still, he says even when racism must be called out, discussions must find common ground and not to start arguments. Let me be clear. I'm not saying that we should refrain from voicing our unhappiness or that minority Singaporeans should pipe down about the prejudices they experience. On the contrary, we should be upfront and honest about the racialized experiences various groups feel and deal squarely with them. But we should not insist on maximum entitlements and rights for our respective groups, construe every compromise as an injustice that needs to be condemned, or put the worst interpretation on every perceived slight or insensitivity. Doing so will lead to a slippery slope to tribalism, hostility, and even identity politics. Instead, Singapore must steady the course with its own brand of multiculturalism. We do not devalue diversity, but we accept it and we celebrate it. Multiracialism in Singapore doesn't mean forgetting our separate racial, linguistic, religious and cultural identities. Instead, it enjoins us to embrace our inheritances, respect those of others, and go beyond them to encompass a national identity and shared purpose. He says the country arrived at this point in history with much effort from previous generations. That is why race is a cornerstone in Singapore's constitution and policies. To put it simply, if race did not pose an existential challenge, Singapore would never have separated from Malaysia and we would never have become an independent sovereign state. But our founding leaders also knew that creating a Singaporean Singapore was not simply a matter of mouthing slogans. They knew we needed deliberate policies, carefully thought out safeguards and resolute efforts to ensure that minorities would be protected, 
that the majority will not abuse its dominance, that bigots and chauvinists from whatever race would be constrained and curbed. Still, he acknowledges that these policies need to be refined as society's attitudes evolve. Our policies are not cast in stone. For any policy, be it GRC, EIP, self-help groups or SAP schools, we continually ask ourselves, what is it we are trying to achieve? Is the policy still relevant today? Can it be further fine-tuned or improved? And one current example is our review of Muslim nurses wearing the tudong with their uniform. This process of policy review entails detailed study and extensive dialogue between the government and our various communities. It cannot be rushed, nor should ch things be changed simply based on who shouts the loudest. Ultimately, he says any change must strengthen racial harmony, while giving each group room to go about its way of life. We must have the humility to acknowledge our multiracialism is still a work in progress. The honesty to recognize that not everyone will want to move at the same pace and yet persevere to protect our multiracialism, cherish it, nurture it, strengthen it. Then step by step, we can approach ever more closely to our ideal, one united people, regardless of race, language or religion. At a later Q&A session, Mr Wong also explained why it's important not to jump to conclusions too early when it comes to calling out so-called racist acts. If a behaviour is clearly discriminatory, hurtful, I think we must take a very firm stance. Mm -hmm. There should be no doubt about that. But there may well be behaviours which are accidental, ambiguous, and in calling out, I think we should also not rush to assume the worst of people. Right. And because this can easily lead to misunderstanding and cause things to, you know, get to worsen unnecessarily. More than 1,500 people tuned in to the virtual event, during which Mr. Wong also responded to calls for a bolder activist or muscular approach to double down on multiracialism. He warned against what he called radical approaches, which could spiral into violence, especially since the topic of race is still sensitive among some groups. We must have the courage and conviction to move forward as much as we can. But if muscular means being aggressive, mm. being confrontational, pushing or, you know, seeking more radical approaches, thinking that the way we go about doing things, which is through mutual understanding compromise, is passé. Yes. And that now there are new ways of doing it that are more radical, extreme, and we might get achieve more using these means. If I think if that's muscular, I think we would be um, moving in the wrong direction. As to whether laws could be tweaked to strengthen race relations, he said what's important is building long-lasting social networks and to foster understanding. The law is important, certainly, but uh, law is not sufficient to address many issues and to change mindsets and to change attitudes. I think the basic sort of starting point is to start building, strengthening our community networks, yeah. start developing more opportunities, more platforms for interactions between people of different communities and races. On youth and civic groups leading discussions on the topic of race and racism, Mr Wong said that he encouraged them to keep doing so. But everyone has a part to play, including authorities. The government will, you know, is committed to finding more, more platforms, more space, safe spaces where we can have these um, constructive dialogues and engagements. And we'll be very open to hearing from people what they think uh, their views are on how we can create more of such safe spaces, be it online or offline, face to face. Some of it can be done in closed doors, some of it can be done in an open dialogue like this. 
on whether Singapore would get to see a prime minister of a minority race, he said that person will have to mobilize people of all walks and lead the party to win elections. But he highlighted that a 2016 IPS survey showed that a significant proportion of Singaporeans preferred a prime minister of their own race. A minority who wants to be prime minister should be aware of these attitudes. It doesn't mean that he, or for that matter she, can't be a prime minister, but these are the realities on the ground. I should also say it doesn't mean that we should just accept these as attitudes and as they are and say, fine, this so be it. We shouldn't accept these attitudes. We should instead work very hard to change them.